data, it's not. And uh, others are data that I have collected myself, um, which is probably one of the few things that have been good about the pandemic uh, that um, I've had to go back to the lab. And this has been um, an amazing challenge and also a lot of fun. Okay. So um, the question in my lab has to do with how microbes and really the environment, right, shape um, the uh, physiology and also the ability of animals to respond to stress and also how they are capable of passing these learnings to their progeny. So I'm going to talk about two topics today. Next, please. So microbes have influenced the evolution of life and they are really uh, together with everything that it's alive. So you can see here pictures of bacteria um, with uh, algae, um, pictures of bacteria forming biofilms that are also uh, in individual particles. They're shown with the arrows uh, that are eaten by worms. These worms are very special because they live in, uh, in, in very far under the, uh, the surface of, of the planet. So meaning that worms and bacteria can live together in really unthinkable places. This is 1.4 kilometers under the surface of, of the earth in, in specific mines in South Africa. And also, as you can see in the middle slide, uh, microbes really populate the intestines of uh, humans and, and all organisms. Next, please. So um, microbes are also our most immediate environment, and uh, it's been estimated that the relationship between microbe and human cells is one to one. But when you take a look at the uh, potential of these uh, of the genes that uh, microbes have, uh, it it really surpasses the number of genes that humans have. So we have to live with the number of microbes that produce metabolites that uh, arise from the huge spectrum of of possibilities that they have. So uh, probably you've heard this, so um, I will be brief at, at, at stating the importance of the biota in, in our bodies, but they train our immune system, contribute with vitamin and other essential nutrients, and they help us actually metabolize food and influence physiology, behavior, and also the ability uh, to be uh, sick or to be healthy. Next, please. So um, there's been an, uh, many reports that intestinal microbes modulate brain function and disease, right? And one less studied chapter, which is something we are very interested in my lab, next please, it's how um, microbes actually modulate neurodegeneration and the ability of broken neurons to be repaired. This is really important, next please, because in many diseases that are neurodegenerative, we find that there is a dysbiosis, meaning that microbes are not uh, the same in abundance or in type as in uh, healthy individuals. So this is one of the questions that we have been addressing in my lab. Next, please. So in the human um, intestines, there, there are many different bacteria to the point that it's really a universe that it's almost very difficult to tackle, right? Because microbes are very diverse and they inhabit different places in, in our body, uh, specifically in the, in the intestine is where they are um, greater in numbers, right? So in order to sort of um, tackle questions that have to do with the relationship with the microbiota and the physiology of organisms, we have um, moved into a pioneer system that it's really much more simple. Next, please. So this organism, it's the nematode C. elegans. And um, if you can uh, give me the next. So we owe a lot in our, in our field to John Salston, who was the person who, um, together with other colleagues, basically studied the lineage of the worm and established that worms have uh, a fixed number of cells and also from where each cell arises. And also importantly for the next, please, uh, for those of us that study the nervous system, they also allowed the study of the connectome. So this is a, a slide that actually shows 
not only the uh, anatomical connectome, but also the functional connectome. So right now we also know, we know how many cells the worms have. We also know how many neurons they have and who these neurons connect to. So there are in, uh, 302 neurons of which we also know which are chemicals and which are uh, uh, electrical synapses, which is extremely useful when you want to study single cells or single neurons or single circuits in the worm. Next, please. Also, another advantage of studying C. elegans, it's, and this goes, it's true for many other uh, model organisms, which I also uh, know that in, in, in your your institute, there is a, a number of people devoted to studying Drosophila. So Drosophila and worms are uh, similar in terms of their advantages, um, but the worms are really ancestral. And when we want to study the relationship in a relationship with, where both parts learn from each other, the fact that they have been together forever, it's a very important uh, detail here, right? So uh, bacteria were the first organisms in Earth, but later when certain animals appear much er much before the what it's called the Cambric explosion, right? Which is uh, shown in blue here together with modern humans. There were a number of other organisms among which worms um, were one of them, not specifically C. elegans, but nematodes. Next, please. Nematodes are also the most abundant animals on earth. So four of, of every five animal, it's a nematode. And this has been recently quantified in the reference that I'm showing there, right? So uh, worms account for approximately 0.3 gigatons of our um, of, of uh, the biosphere, right? And so studying the relationship with worms, uh, it's not only important because the animals are simpler and because we want to learn about the relationship be between the biota and our physiology, but also studying worms in themselves, it's extremely relevant, specifically under the um, current situation of climate change, because um, most of these most of these nematodes are also bacteriborne. So they, what, what they eat is relevant and how they can develop in the ecosystem is also very relevant. Next, please. So C. elegans, it's a, as, as I mentioned, is a bacterivore and it's a great variety of bacteria. And uh, in this picture, you can see the different organs inside because the worms are transparent. But also there is this very beautiful picture of the paper that I uh, cite there that shows in red the bacteria that it's inside the intestine of the worm. So uh, this is a stain that, that marks all bacteria. So you can see in red, unfortunately, I, I cannot point out because I'm not managing exactly. That's the, that's the place. So that's the intestine and it's full with bacteria colored in red. Uh, next, please. And um, my colleagues working in, um, in the natural microbiomes have identified more than 25 species. So the relationship, it's like 300 to 1,000 in humans, and it's about 25 and more in these worms. And uh, I expect that this number to go higher because we have been uh, examining. Most of these studies have been done in the Northern Hemisphere. And when we studied uh, the relationship with worms in the Southern Hemisphere, specifically in Chile, which is where I live, uh, we have found certain bacteria that are not present in the microbiota uh, reported in the Northern Hemisphere. So there is this is supposed to grow. However, uh, next please. There are a number of bacteria that have, are of interest to us, such as human microbes, human pathogens, and also laboratory strains that have been very well studied, so they serve as models to study this relationship. Next, please. So here I will tell you briefly about how microbial metabolites shape neuronal health, specifically neuronal degeneration, and also the avoidance of stressful microbiota or pathogenic microbiota, how that is learned and also inherited. Next, please. We start with the first one. Next. And I would like to tell you first, so that we are extremely clear, what are uh, what is the um, the cellular model that we use. So we have already told you that the number of cells in the worm are fixed, 
what is shown in the middle panel, it's uh, the, the nervous system of the worm. And within those cells, which are 302, six of them are touch cells that are um, the ones that are responsible for the response to the gentle touch. So how do we touch a worm? The worm is touched with an eyelash, right? And so what we are going to see in this video, thank you, is that when you touch them in the head, they move backwards. When you touch them in the tail, they move forward, right? So this is all orchestrated by the circuitry that is being shown in the bottom panel with the cells in green. These are six cells. However, when these cells don't work well, you see what is happening in the bottom, right? When that we touch the animal and the animal is largely insensitive. So the worm does move because there is there isn't any problem with the rest of the circuitry or the muscles or the motor neurons that are in charge of eliciting this movement. However, the sensor is not working here. So we can also couple the, uh, every time we study these cells with the functional test. So when I will tell you the story of the repair of these cells, I also tell you that they are being repaired, not just morphologically, but functionally. Next, please. So we are in the, in the touch system of the worm, and now I want to tell you what is the molecular model of damage that we use to induce neurodegeneration. Next, please. So the mechanosensory channel, which is the one that allows for this response to happen, it's formed by a number of proteins, one of which is the pore-forming unit, and it's called MEC4, right? It's, it's there in, in light blue. Next, please. When MEC4 it's working properly and we touch the worm, what happens is that there is an inward cu current of sodium. This is a sodium channel, right, which is shown there in these in this, uh, recordings. Now, when you, when you lift the, um, the pressure, then there is again another inward current of sodium, right? And you can see the cell, next please, the cell, it's, it looks exactly like, like that one. This is the posterior, um, the posterior cell, it's called the PLM, it's one of the ones at the tail. So you see that it has this um, sort of hat-shaped uh, soma and a very, a very long axon, right? However, when this, um, when this protein called MEC4, which is the pore forming unit, has a mutation, next please, that makes the pore being open all the time, then there is, an, there is a, a current that it's going in all the time, which is a sodium current. But together with that sodium current, there is another current, which is calcium, that goes in as well. And we do know what happens when calcium is increased inside a cell. Please, next one. Uh, the increase of calcium also promotes more increase of intracellular calcium that has been released from intracellular stores, such as the reticulum or the mitochondria. And in a previous study, we showed that a number of things can stop the degeneration that is mediated by MEC4 and later by this calcium current, uh, such as diapause formation, which is uh, uh, the hibernation state in the worm, the use of antioxidants, etc. Right? And so when when the uh, the cell death is at its peak, you will see what happens with the cell. Next one. So the cell that you see um, in, in this nice shape at the left now becomes round and it becomes swollen. So the, the, the GFP that you see on the other side that it's out of focus is the sister cell for this PLM because these cells are uh, the, two, the one it's at the left, the other one it's at the right. So that the two cells are dying at the time you see that there is not even an axon to be observed because these cells are also embryonic. They are born when the animal it's still an embryo, and therefore when the animal hatches, already these cells have degenerated. So in order to overcome this and to be able to study neurodegeneration, we look in one cell of this circuit, which is the AVM. It's that cell that it's in the middle of the body of the worm. Please give me the next one where, where you can see it more clearly. So this is the AVM neuron, and that's a post-embryonic neuron that it's born when the animal, it's 12 hours uh, old, right? So uh, that is the um, uh, what what is depicted there is the the wild type form of the axon. But when these cells are expressing MEC4D, this mutation that it uh, makes the channel being open all the time, then 
it degenerates in a very stereotypical manner. The next one, please. And you can, the next, and you can see that the cell starts being, uh, it, it breaks down in a sort of in the, from distal to proximal, right? And then it disappears. So we have uh, make uh, different categories for this. But in this talk, I'm only going to focus on the uh, axon wild type form, which is the one that it's functional, right? Yeah. So what I showed there is that the animal reaches adulthood in 72 hours, which is also an experimental advantage of C. elegans that you can do experiments in three days, essentially. You know whether what is happening with these neurons, right? And it's also relevant from the point of view of studying disease because this is a progressive degeneration that actually reaches its peak when the animal is an adult. And what I'm showing here in, in this graph, it's how this neuron degenerates and how at 72 hours, you almost don't have uh, many neurons that, that are left. And therefore, we study all the experiments, start with animals that are recently hatching, and we examine them at the 70, at 72 hours when they are adults. So where did I put this on the title? Make 4D neurons degenerate progressively on 1974 E. coli, right? So far, before the explosion of the microbiota field, we all believed that um, the things that we were seeing, the phenotypes we were seeing, are something endogenous to the animal. So these cells die in this stereotyped, stereotyped way after 72 hours, right? But this is all true in the strain of bacteria that we've used to feed the animal since its origin. And 1974, I mean, because it was the first warm paper uh, done by Sidney Brenner, and, and he chose this bacteria for a completely different reason, right? And now that we have been changing the bacteria of the worm, we realize that everything that you observe depends on the bacteria the worm is eating, right? So give me the next one, please. So what we wanted to, to know, it's how the, the, the dynamic of, of degeneration, it's affected by the different bacterial strains. So we examine human pathogens, laboratory strains, natural microbiota. The next one, please. And what you can see in this, um, in this graph, it's that every bacteria gives a different output, essentially. So again, when we talk about this is the phenotype, you really have to say with which bacteria you are, you are treating the animals. And so we have there a number of strains that are using, that are being used in the lab. We have E. coli that are modeled E. coli, and we have other pathogens, for instance, like, like Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And then we have also bacteria that we found in the wild. Right, next please. From all of this, there is one that it's clearly the worst, which happens to be also the one that we've been feeding the worms uh, from forever, right? And there is another one, which is E. coli HT115, also very well known in the worm community, because this is the strain in which we use, uh, in which we use for delivering RNAi, right? So um, for those of you that, that haven't heard about this, there is a library of all C. elegans genes that was engineered in this strain of bacteria, which is being made to produce double-stranded RNA. And so th that, that's why we have it in the lab, right? And we tested it and it happens to produce the biggest protection. And so here I have I have ruled out that uh, this does not have anything to do with the double-stranded RNA. So we have done the proper controls for that, right? So here we have two strains of E. coli, which is also very convenient in order to compare them, right? Because bacterial species are different as, as other species that we know. So it's uh, not because they are bacteria, they're similar, right? So it was kind of advantageous for us to have the good and the bad in the same uh, species of bacteria. So next, please. And we decided to focus on what is different between the one and the other. And the first thing we ask is whether the protective bacteria, from now on, instead of saying HD115, I'm going to call this one the protective bacteria and the other one the unprotected, but un unprotective bacteria. So we studied unique genes we looked for overexpression of genes that were not unique, that both bacteria have, but that they were overexpressed in one, and also the overabundance of metabolites. So with these three strategies, first, we analyze the genomes, 
um, and the transcriptomes. This is a, this is sort of a slide showing the combination of both, where we found please, uh, next please that the protective bacteria and not the unprotective expresses a, 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 um, an enzyme, but it's the glutamic decarboxylase. Glutamic decarboxylases are um, in our brains as well. This is a common enzyme in the, in the nervous system used to produce GABA from glutamic acid. Next, please. That's the reaction that this um, enzyme catalyzes. Together with that, we also found that among the shared genes, but that were overexpressed in the protective bacteria, you could find the antiporter. Next, please. So the antiporter of glutamate and GABA, what does in the bacteria, it's to uh, promote the entry of glutamate and the exit of GABA, right? So this is starting to look like a, like a, like the GABA shunt, which is well described in uh, enteric bacteria that use this system in order to alleviate the pressure of acidic environments, right? So there are other decarboxylases as well. Um, but this is a, a very interesting uh, uh, sort of uh, strategy used by intestinal microbes to actually raise the pH because every time that you this this reaction is catalyzed, one proton is being consumed. So that's the way they do it in order to sustain very low pH. So what we um, first did, it's um, give me the next one, please. Um, was to what uh, geneticists do, which is to mutate next, to mutate this, um, this enzyme, and we created the, uh, the delta GAT mutant. And we tested whether this bacteria, the protected, protective bacteria without this enzyme, is capable of protecting. So here you can see that the delta GAT uh, strain does not protect, but when you re- um, provide the plasmid in the in the mutant bacteria with the with this enzyme then you can reconstitute the protection that we found before so now we can we can say that this enzyme it's important for neuroprotection but let's take a look at the metabolites next please in order to look at metabolites, we associated with our friend in Argentina, Paula Burdizo, who is an expert in, next please, in uh, NMR, in nuclear magnetic resonance experiments. And we provided extracts from bacteria that are protective, non-protective bacteria, and the mutant bacteria that I just mentioned to you. So she compared the three extracts of this, and she came up with the following results. Can you give me the next one, please? That protective bacteria have an over um, abundance of GABA, which is also coherent with what we, what I just recently told you, because this enzyme, it's in charge of actually producing GABA starting in glutamate. And very importantly as well, if you look at the abundance of metabolites in the, in the bacteria that used to be protective, but now doesn't have this enzyme, what it accumulates is the substrate, right? You can see there, there that there is glutamate. Apart from that, next please. In the comparison between the protective bacteria versus the unprotective together with the mutant one, what we find is that GABA is the discriminant metabolite, but also there is lactate, there is sucrose and maltose. And so far we have studied GABA and a little bit of lactate. And the other two, we still have nothing. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't know much about them. But this is a topic of uh, future investigation. Next, please. So now we wanted to ask whether GABA itself could be protective next. And what we find is that when we provide GABA to the mutant bacteria, now we can reconstitute the protection. And the question is whether the unprotective bacteria together with GABA can provide protection next. And you can see here that even though the protection is not as great as the other bacteria, because probably GABA is not the only thing that makes this bacteria protective, you can see that it's significantly different if, whether we give them GABA or we give them the genetic construction that carries the enzyme together with the substrate, which is in the second column there. And also we tried lactate in the, uh, the non-protective bacteria and lactate really protects a lot, right? But lactate was only found in 
the um, in the uh, NMR experiments, where in using transcriptomics and genomics, we couldn't come up with the uh, with with lactate being uh, a potential important metabolite, which also suggests that in order to get it to this point, we really have to do everything, right? So you, if you don't do metabolomics, you can also miss out on things that will not be seen otherwise. Next, please. So the one thing we wanted to test in order to extrapolate this, it's whether GABA itself or the presence of this of these enzyme was uh, could be correlated with protection. Next. And we examined a number of data to show that both the activity of the enzyme together with the amount of GABA, both of them correlated well with the, with the uh, category of axon protected, right? So then this means that this can be taken out of context. And we examine a number of bacteria that, have, uh, that are produced by the human uh, microbiota, please, uh, next. And I, I, I show you here a number of these, such as the Bifidobacter adolescentis, Lactobacillus, et cetera, that produce both GABA and lactate, and those are pres uh, they are present in our microbiota. Uh, and also those are probiotics themselves used uh, uh, commonly in yogurts, et cetera. All of them are extremely protective in C. elegans. So this also helps us take this knowledge um, out of the worm and try to um, examine other bacteria that are present in other animals and even in humans, right? Next, please. So what we believe here is that GABA, it's likely being exported from the bacterial, uh, from the bacterial cell to the intestine of the worm. Um, to be available to the worm body, right? So you can see here what I'm showing, it's an analysis that was done by us with the, with the transcriptome of the bacteria. So we looked at the level of expression of the different parts of these um, sort of uh, en enzymes that take GABA and degrade it and enzymes that take GABA and export it. So the, our, our assumption is that GABA is being exported because both the anti-porter and other uh, proteins that are permeases of GABA are much more highly expressed than those enzymes that use GABA to produce succinic acid and include it in the in the uh, cycle uh, of the uh, of, in the Krebs cycle, basically. So what we favor is that GABA becomes available in the intestine to the worm. And now the next question: Can we continue? The next question that we have here: It's how how is this happening, right? So you, we have this um, GABA that it's available in the intestine. How is this may reach the neurons, right? So what mechanistic insight we have so far? Next, please. Just to contextualize uh, next, um, we can take advantage of a magnificent project that it's been um, uh, shown in the Worm Atlas, a uh, project that is being led by David Hall in the Worm community, that they are making um, electronic micro, uh, micrographs of, of the entire worm. So this is called the slideable worm. It's like taking a salami and cutting it in many slices and you can examine slide by slide. And here I'm showing you one slide where you can see the intestine in the middle. I don't know whether you can see it there, but it says lumen and then it says intestinal villi. Um, in the middle of the, of the, exactly right there. So there is the lumen, that's where the bacteria are. And then there is the intestinal cell. And these metabolites, if what we believe it's true, need to make way from there to the rest of the body. So here in, in, in yellow, I'm showing you the, um, this one got moved a little bit, but it doesn't matter. It, I meant to show the ALM, which is one of the touch cells. And the importance here is that these cells that are being protected are really far from the intestine, right? So you can see them in the sides of the worm, right? They are very near the cuticle. So we wonder how these metabolites get there. And then we examine, uh, give me the next one, please, where you can see it a little bit uh, with the close-up. There is the ALM. If they have to go through intestine, hypodermis, the other ALM on the other side have to go through the gonad, right? And the other, the, the ones at the bottom that are in the ventral cord that I'm not showing here also have to go through other neuronal tissue. So we examine then next a number of uh, possibilities that.
are these are transporters or, or receptors that have something to do with GABA or with other solutes, right? All of these um, proteins have ortho orthologs in other organisms. So these proteins have been shown to be present mostly in neurons, but they are also, by, by a very beautiful work done by uh, Marie Gendrel in, in France, she showed that there are many, these, these receptors are not only in the neurons, they can be found in many, many other tissues. So please give me the next one. We took advantage of RNAi uh, tissue specific to show that these genes are required in the system of the worm. What I'm showing at the left, it's um, touch neuron specific RNAi, and on the right, this is systemic RNAi in the rest of the body, non-neuronal, right? So what, what this seems to show is that there are a number of GABA or other solute transporters that are required along the, the, the body of the worm, so that it's likely that GABA actually exits the intestine and moves throughout the body. But we cannot only say it's GABA itself. There can only be a whole bunch of other like regu regulatory mechanisms, such as, let's say, gene expression, et cetera. Next one, please. So that one of the things that we had shown previously in, back in 2012 is that the insulin pathway was extremely important to uh, provide neurodegeneration. So we showed next that when we uh, mutate DAF2, which is the insulin receptor, then you can see um, a higher um, neuroprotection. And DAF2, it's upstream of DAF16, which is FOXO in, in all other animals. And FOXO is a transcription factor that does its work in the nucleus of, of, the, of each Right, so when you see that DAF16 is activated, you can see this pattern that I'm showing in the center where GFP goes from being cytosolic to being nuclear, right? That's where when DAF16 is activated. And what we show here as well, next please, is that DAF16 is necessary for the protective bacteria to do their effect. If DAF16 is mutated, then there is no protection, even if you have the uh, the protective bacteria in the media. So um, this suggests that there is a combination of transport mechanisms, gene regulation, etc. So in order to um, make more advance in this, next please. What we, did, what we did was to analyze uh, gene expression, and this is, uh, we, I'm, I'm entering now in the unpublished uh, chapter here. What we did is to do transcriptomic of worms feeding on the two different bacteria. Before I have shown you results of transcriptomics of the bacteria, but these are transcriptomics of worms that are feeding the unprotective and the protective bacteria. So in gray, you see the unprotective. In green, you see the protective bacteria. And we examined this at 12, 24, and 48 hours, right before the animals become adults. And the reason for not examining adults is simple. It's because adults carry embryos. And when we did not want to see expression in embryos confused with the one in the animal. So uh, next, please. What we see here is that there are a number of genes that are upregulated. The upregulated are in colors and downregulated are in gray. Uh, and what we find is that there are a number of genes that are regulated early, and most of them are between 12 and 24 hours, right? Um, so the regulation is primarily very early in the development. And these all these genes group basically in those that have to do with neuronal processes. So it's it's quite uh, impressive that you do transcriptomics of the whole worm and you, also, and you can see this level of specificity having to do with neuronal metabolism, uh, development, um, pathfinding, etc. Next, please. And in order for us to test what uh, is the contribution of each of these genes. We treated uh, the worms with RNAi for these genes. So I told you that the library, it's being built on the protective bacteria. So this is very advantageous as well, because we can do uh, gene knockdown in uh, the same bacteria that was used to protect. So we give protection and we remove protection by eliminating certain genes. So, so far we have 
uh, tested almost half of them, and I show you here the results. What we find is that a number of genes are important in uh, the body of the worm. This is systemic RNAi, what I showed you before, affecting all, all cells except the neurons. And then the other one, it's only in the touch receptor neurons. And as you can see, um, there is a number of genes that are required both in the system and in the, in the touch receptor neurons, and others are only in the, in the, in the body. And, uh, there is one, which is NEP8, which is only relevant in the touch cells. So um, I'm showing you here in the next that many of these genes have um, uh, well-known functions, so like FAR3, which is um, a fatty acid uh, enzyme, and many of them, next please, are related to um, human diseases that um, have been uh, studied by others. So um, this is... this ongoing work uh, we expect to finish soon so i can tell you a, a much more complete story of those that are there untested um next please the other thing that we have as future plans are uh, next um uh, to study how specifically these neurons those of you that are that are uh, curious about how the neuron itself responds to diet so once the, the let's say the metabolite reaches or the gene expression differs or uh, there is a signaling that that travels a signaling wave from the intestine how does that impact the the uh, touch receptor neurons the one of the things that we are um, next please that we asked here is uh, what happened to the receptor itself and in this work uh, what we show is that the receptor itself so the the um the channel itself it's the same in terms of expression and localization as the in the unprotected as in the protective bacteria next one please so we are we want to study the electrical behavior of the touch receptor neurons uh, after we provide the protective uh, diet we are looking at calcium homeostasis and calcium it's extremely important but here um, there are some surprising results because calcium it's required for degeneration but what it has also been reported is that calcium is needed for regeneration of cells and coherently with that we we have found that uh, calcium levels are required for the protection of diet having to do with bacterial metabolites and we are also studying mitochondrial dynamics with uh, greatly change um, in in accordance to um, to dietary inputs so I think that um, this is um, the um, the first story. I think we don't have time to go into the next, unfortunately, because of all the the different um, the situations we had in the beginning. But uh, maybe a next how, how, time. How long do you think to... it takes, and Andrea? Hmm? How long do you think it, it takes you? It takes probably fifteen minutes. Um, maybe we can ask people. What do you know? What do you think, uh, everyone? Should we go for the next? story i think we should <laughs> we should have i'll make it very quick okay, okay great so one, of the, one of the other things that we are really interested in, and i think that you guys in the in the center can can give me feedback on that is that uh how does complex microbiota affect neuronal health right so one of the things next that we are uh, that we are um, assessing right now. It's how the combination of microbes from the microbiome that we found in the wild, this is also uh, unpublished, affects really the neuronal protection, right? So what we show next is that individual bacteria are completely different from uh, putting the bacteria together. Example, we have um, two bacteria, which are illustrated here, and two and three, when you look at two and three individually, both of them are protective, but when they are together, protection disappears. So one of the things that we are doing right now is to study what are the metabolites produced by the togetherness of these bacteria that are causing this problem, right? So next, please. Well, thank you so much for giving me this extra time. I'm gonna tell you now what we know about how microbes avoid uh, bacteria that are not good for them in the, in the long term. So all organisms enter dormancy on hostile environments, right? Um, 
this happens to insects, it's, it happens to mammals that hibernate, uh, it happens to sea elegans that enters diapause, and it happens in a fantastic way to tardigrades. So uh, I, I love tardigrades, I haven't studied them, but they are the most impressive uh, example of cryptobiosis that there are. So before, these um, hostile environments have been defined as the food shortage, high temperature, very low temperature, and we demonstrated that there is another hostile environment, which is specific bacteria of the microbiota that also triggers the formation of diapause in the worm. So this is the story that I will tell you now. Next, please. So um, C. elegans enters diapause upon stress. Next. The story about the three days that I told you is when the animals are plentiful, right? But when there is, when there is hunger, they form the dower larvae. The dower larvae is developmentally regulated. It can only be formed from this stage that I'm showing there. So all their animals cannot enter diapause, right? And that has an evolutionary importance because the idea here is to um, keep animals in a younger state pre-gravid so that when they exit this stressful situation, they can actually uh, colonize the world again, right? Next, please. So dower larvae can be as dowers for like three or four months and they can come out when, when the situation improves, right? One of the important things, technically important for us, is that dowers close their mouth and they become detergent resistant. Next. So when, when uh, animals become uh, dowers, they close their mouth, they don't feed, and they also develop, they also express something that my, uh, my colleagues in Germany um, discover, which is a nematoid that allows them to do this phenomena that most nematodes do, which is called nictation. And they stick to each other, forming these dower towers that you can see on the right. And that allows them to actually be carried to different places by insects that are passing by. So they maximize the, the, the surface in the, in the vertical plane so that they can be moved to a better place, right? And probably uh, your flies are helping in that. So what we show here is that animals, when they are feeding on pathogens that are of mild virulence, so pathogens that make you sick in the long term, not those that kill you, those that make you sick, such as Salmonella enterica or Pseudomonas that are uh, bacteria of, that infect humans, those are worms growing on the normal plate, so you, you see that they are moving, etc. but then we treat them with detergent right, to separate those that are forming dowers, right? That's how we quantify it. No? Next, please. So we see that in the bacteria that it's normal food, there are no dowers formed, but when you uh, expose them to these other pathogens, you can count the dowers that are shown here with the, with the arrows. Those are the survivors of the SDS treatment, and they are shown here, the quantification. Um, for example, um, Salmonella tifi, which is a, a human pathogen, doesn't provide inf a sickness in any other. Uh, it's a very, it's a very host-specific thing. So in in worms, also they don't make them sick, and and therefore they don't need to be defended. On the other hand, a strain such as PA14 of Pseudomonas, it's extremely toxic to the worm, and therefore they don't go, uh, they cannot grow successfully for many generations. So, the bottom line of this slide is that animals defend themselves by forming the dower larvae in the second generation of exposure to bacteria, never in the first one, always in the second one. So that tells me that there is an accumulation of an information that needs to occur. There is a process of, of actually making sure that this bacteria makes you sick in order to take such a drastic decision as, of, as if to exit the developmental uh, cycle. Next, please. So, what, what I just showed you here, it's that animals um, need for this to happen in a period of time. So that tells me that the, what is happening, in, it's accumulative. It's also heritable because it happens in the first generation, but actually the, the response, it's in the second, right? And that really sounds like RNA interference process, that it's heritable. It's um, it's uh, uh, cumulative and um, 
and it's also systemic. It's something that enters in the mouth and then it spreads to the body. So what we did, also we had an important bias because I had studied RNAi during my PhD, but um, I want to persuade you that it was the other thing that led me to look at this mutant. So uh, next, please. There are many different mutants of, of uh, that fail to perform RNAi, being because systemic RNAi, it's impaired. Uh, the amplification process is impaired or uh, more specifically within the individual cell. So we examine all these mutants that I'm showing you there to show finally that our formation under pathogenesis, not under the other stimuli, right? Um, it's required, it re requires the RNAi machinery. And the RNAi machinery, what it does is to produce RNAs that are interfering RNAs, endogenous and also processing of the exogenous material that it's in the form of double-stranded RNA. So we decided to look for RNA as the trigger molecules for diapause formation under pathogens, right? Next, please. So just to um, summarize here, what I have showed you is that pathogen exposure causes diapause formation in the second generation. We also wanted to know whether animals could remember this, this um, experience that they had. So in order to do that, you have to do an experiment that shows that this information is transgenerationally inherited. So technically, the way to do that is to let two generations pass where the animals are not exposed to the pathogen and then you challenge them again to see whether they can remember but they have to show a way to remember really quickly otherwise it's the same process as the other right so we expose them for two generations f1 and f2 then we remove the pathogens we re-expose them to pathogens and we ask do they form dowers in the first generation after re-exposure and please show me the next. And you can see here that now when they are re-exposing the F5 shown in gray here, they immediately form dowers, right? So that means that the animals have remembered the encounter even after two generations of being completely deprived from the pathogen. If you are wondering how I make sure that they are not in contact with pathogen, we bleach the animals. The eggs of the F2 are taken from the mothers and they are placed on the non-pathogenic bacteria. So there is, we are not carrying bacteria from the previous generation, right? So now we have that this is dependent on the RNAi machinery. It's transgenerationally transmitted. And we also know from the works of Oded Reshavi that um, small RNAs are important uh, molecules in transgenerational responses, right? So everything collides for us to uh, next, please, to study actually um, the the uh, the relationship with RNA uh, in the in the host, even when we are looking at uh, interspecies communication. So the other thing that we wanted to ask is whether which goes together with the small RNAs, right? Whether this memory and whether this uh, learning process is epigenetic. And in C. elegans, there are a number of, um, of histone methyl transferases that do mono D uh, trimethylations uh, to the histones. Uh, next, please. That are orthologue of human um, uh, histone methyl transferases, and we we tried them to see whether they have anything to do with our formation. Next, so here you have that um, at least three of them, Z18, Z32, and HPL2, are required for the first response to be um, generated. Right. So this is the one that we see in F2, right? The first defensive mechanism. Now we asked, SET25 and MET2 were capable of forming normal amounts of towers. Actually, MET2, it's a little bit higher, but they form normal. So they are not requiring that first phase. Next, please. But when we test them in the transgenerational way, we realized, that you can see in black here, that SET25, which is a, um, it's a histone uh, methyl transferase, um, that puts three methyl groups, that one it's required for the memory. So we still do not know whether 
SEP25, it's required to keep the memory or to actually do the recall, which is what happens in the F in the F5. But with this, we show, and there is still much to be learned from here, that this also it's epigenetic. So we have the RNAi machinery on the one hand, we know that it's epigenetic, and we can also, this is a further step in suggesting that RNAs are involved because RNAs in the worm have been uh, strongly linked with her heterochromatin formation, right? Next, please. So what we do now is to actually look at the transcriptomes in the holobiont, right? So what we ask is which RNAs from bacteria trigger this behavior? Is this interspecies communication possible? Is, can bacterial RNAs get into the worm body to signal the behavior that we are observing? And also which worm RNAs are involved in this response. So the thesis work of Caroline shown here answer the second question, and we were able to show that um, a small RNA called MIR243, it's a micro RNA, it's important, this is being published. So I just want to show you the work of Marcella, which is currently in preprint, uh, where we <coughs> examine the RNAs of bacteria comparing naive bacteria. Naive bacteria is that that has not seen a worm before. There is the worms that have bacteria in the F1 generation, so those are not naive, but they are in for the first time with the worm, and those that are in the second generation with the worm, right? So we have naive bacteria, F1 bacteria, and F2 bacteria. And what we want to know, since this behavior is elicited in the F2, what are those genes that are expressed in the F2 that are not in the F1 and are not in the naive bacteria. So here, what I show you in this Venn diagram is that in the F2 compared to naive, we have a gene called RSMY, which is a small RNA from bacteria that it's required for quorum sensing. It has been described before and it's related to the GAC-A system that we find to be exclusively expressed in bacteria that are in the intestine of F2 animals. And what we do is to <clears throat> test the mutant for delta, uh, the, the delta RSMY um, uh, um, bacteria, and we show that it's unable to form, uh, to trigger diapause in the worms. And what we also show is that by putting RSMY in the E. coli that normally doesn't trigger diapause, it's capable now of restoring the response. Now, um, here in this experiment, we had to provide a little bit of the mutant um, uh, pseudomona in order to give context, because this RNA alone, it's not capable of doing everything, right? So the animals also need an infection protocol where you need to signal to them that they are in the presence of a proper pathogenicity. But in order to do that, we use the mutant bacteria. We never give them RSMY. So this shows that RSMY heterologously expressed, it's capable of doing this. Next, please. Um, yeah, well, this got a little get this got changed a little bit, but this is the person who helped us with this. So I I just want to um, next please. I just want to uh, show you what it's our rationale for this. Um, how do, do we believe that this is happening? Uh, we think that when animals are being uh, infected, which is called here pathogenesis in the uh, for two generations, there are specific RNAs of the bacteria that are being expressed. And now you will tell me, yes, but that's the second generation of the worm. It's not the second generation of the bacteria, exactly. It's many different generations of bacteria. We don't count the replication rate in the intestine. The, the very interesting thing is that naive bacteria in the F2, it's modified by the worm experience of the previous bacteria in the F1, right? So what we believe is that there are different uh, number of uh, RNAs that are expressed specifically in the F2 to establish the formation of diapause, but they are helped by a number of other factors of the bacteria that establish the infection as, as such, the pathogenesis mode. Meanwhile, in the, in the gonad of the animal, 
there has to be a number of changes that are caused by endogenous RNAs and also uh, changes in the chromatin, like I showed you before with the set mutants, right? So probably there is a mark that it's being already formed in the, in the gonad of the worm. Next. So when we get rid of the pathogen in the F3 and the F4, we assume, and this is also part of, of uh, current work, we wonder whether the bacterial RNAs can reach the gonads. That's the first question. Can they actually make it to the gonad? Now, the, 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 the theoretical possibility exists because there are transporters that have been shown to move uh, double-stranded RNA to the gonad. Uh, one of them is called RME2 and has been studied by, by other colleagues, right? not bacterial RNAs, but the possibility, the formal possibility exists that once the RNAs of bacteria are in the worm body, they can also be transported to the gonad. Alternatively, there could be a situation where bacterial RNAs trigger a dif differential expression in the worm and endogenous small RNAs can do that work in the gonad. That's what we call here transgenerational small RNAs. At the same time, there has to be the maintenance of the mark in order to, please next, to be able to observe our formation in the F5 in the first re-exposure, which is what we call the recall. So that would be the memory event, right? It's kind of similar. We are using similar words to the one that we use for neuronal memory, right? This is a different type of memory, but, but not so different in the end. So... <clears throat> What we believe is that there is a basic infection RNA pattern. There is also a transgenerational group of RNAs, and that impacts on the germline so that they can give this response for many different generations. Um, I will show you a slide at the end that, that tells about how many of these things, how many generations this can be remembered. So next, please, uh, in the future, what we would like to do is to actually sample um, the um, outer membrane vesicles from bacteria, because we believe that vesicular transport here, it's a, a possible mechanism more uh, also together with systemic RNA transporters in the worm, they can be coupled to uh, OMVs from bacteria to actually internalize um, bacterial cargo. And the cargo can be RNAs or can be other things. Currently, we are um, testing the possibility of these RNAs that I mentioned you to travel in outer membrane vesicles of this bacteria, right? Um, so this is completely in the future plan. Next, please. And also, there is a, a very exciting uh, paper um, uh, recently by uh, Rachel Posner in the group of, of uh, Odet Rechavi that they show that uh, small RNAs, endogenous small RNAs produced by neurons can travel to the germline to change the worm behavior. So one of the things that we, this has not been shown for bacteria, but um, it's possible that a similar mechanism can happen. So we would like to study neuron-specific RNA effectors to see whether those are the ones causing the, the response. Um, the transgenerational small RNAs in C. elegans, uh, these are ongoing experiment, and also the expression of specific sRNAs in neurons that control our formation. As I mentioned in the beginning, the, all the neurons in the worm uh, are described, they have a, num they have a name and, and we know what they do. And so um, there, is a, there, there are a few neurons that are in charge of uh, promoting and also of um, impairing our formation in the worm. Therefore, those are the candidate neurons that we will be looking at. Uh, next, please. And so this is just to finish, as I mentioned, uh, the memory of these bacteria can last for more than two generations without the pathogen. We calculated that it lasts for about five generations after the removal from this bacteria, right, which is these five generations shown in gray which after then it disappears, right? Which could be also uh, have a relevance evolutionarily speaking because worms uh, shouldn't remember everything that they encounter um, because they are always in the contact of bacteria. So uh, 
But um, I just wanted to leave you with this question that I have myself. Uh, when and how the memory ends, and the question is whether it does it naturally, or uh, naturally I mean by uh, a dilution factor, or it does it abruptly. So what we uh, show here is that when you take the dowers that have been formed in response to pathogens, the dowers themselves, not the rest of the population, and then you re-expose them to the pathogen they have entirely forgotten. So dowers forget, dowers sort of reset the memory, right? And there are other reports that don't talk about dowers, but, but they, they talk about stress to be a reset signal for, for the transgenerational memory. Uh, we are in the process of uh, looking into this uh, to see whether is the dower, uh, what happens to the dower gonad? What, what, what happens to the regulation of the epigenetic regulation in Dower and uh, whether that is what is causing Dowers to entirely forget. So Dowers are the way of saving the population and are also the way of forgetting in the population. Next. And I just want to thank my team and uh, show you this uh, picture of uh, where my, my center is currently in Valparaíso, which is a port. And uh, I have the curiosity, which I hope would be solved at some point, whether it really looks like Lisbon. So I would just have to go and <laughs> check myself. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, the time. It's been great uh, sharing this with you. Thank you so much. Um... I could keep going um, listening to you. It has been great. It was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you Thank also you. so much for staying tuned with us. Um, so let's let's um, let's uh, try to um, to get some discussion going. Uh, so I will so I will go ahead and draw and. Um, read you the first question, which we have here from Rui Rodrigues. Um, and he asks, that contrast between Northern and Southern hemisphere, different uh, microbiota must be very relevant in, in human pathophysiology. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Mm. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for the question. Um, I need I need to be associated with uh, with geneticists to answer that question, and I hope to be able to do that with uh, with the friend who uh, studies wild nematodes. His name is Eric Anderson, and and he has uh, the worm that we collected from Chile, we sent it to him, right? And, and Eric uh, has told me that he's found that uh, worms in the, in the Southern hemisphere, but also around the Pacific Rim are very interesting because they are genetically very diverse, right? Compared to the worms in Europe. So they are very different. And we, uh, precisely the question that, that you're asking, I think that has to do also with a genetic background of worms and also with the conditions in the, in, you know, the climate and et cetera conditions. Although climate itself does not explain because our climate, it's very similar to other climates in Europe where these bacteria have not been found. But um, I would be very interested to see whether the genetic background of the different subspecies of Xenorhabditis elegans have something to do with this. And uh, this, this answer I cannot but just do hand waving. I prefer not to hand wave, uh, but I, I, love to, I love to know. I love to know. Thank you. Um, OK, so while we wait for, for more questions, maybe I can ask you one myself. Um, so I, I'm I, so beautiful work really uh, overall. I think it's it's uh, it's it very well describes you know how complex these systems are, right? So the interaction between host and microbes and so on. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about um, so the first part of your of your talk regarding the neuroprotective action of the microbiota, where you talk about the GABA glutamate. Um, kind of uh, hypothesis, right? Well, it's very strong hypothesis, right? Uh, and so I was wondering if you have um, a, an, an hypothesis of how mechanistically, uh, you know, the entering into the TCA of GABA uh, 
could overall, you know, result in the neuroprotective action of, of neurons, right? So mm -hmm. how do you see these translating into a cellular phenotype? So going from a metabolite mm -hmm. into a cellular, you know, phenotype. And do you think this uh, happens directly in the neurons? Or do you think, you know, as you were mentioning, that mm -hmm. it goes via their organs and so on? Yeah, I... That's that's actually the question that I have at the moment, right? So that's how that's really how this happens, right? Yeah. Um, so I believe that some of these things, given the data, this is only based on on the data that they will cause uh, GABA, which also has an effect on pH, right? Yeah. Uh, on bacteria in intestinal pH, it will cause a wave of signaling to uh, a non-cell-autonomous wave of signaling that combines DAF2, which is the insulin receptor, that necessarily will activate DAF16. We also, I didn't show you here, but the exposure to HD115 causes the migration of DAF16 to the nucleus, right? Okay. But that's also transient. So all these things are temporarily defined, which is also an, another complication, but it's also a fascination. This is how really biology happens. It's, it, it changes in temporal windows. It's not a continuous, and it varies in whether the animal is young or the animal is old, right? Because we see that in a very important gene expression change occurs in the beginning when the worms are exposed to the protective bacteria. Yeah. That also it's coherent, and I'm I'm wandering off a little bit, but um, that it's also coherent with the fact that ex early exposure to HD115 causes protection in late, in, much later in adults, right? So it seems like this early peak in gene expression it's extremely relevant. So I would, I would like to think, I would like to see the path of GABA reaching somewhere, but I have to take into account the fact that GABA might be changing gene expression, and gene expression is the one that impacts finally the physiology okay. of the neuron, which is not something unheard of. Sure, um, sure. Right? So, so but you think of it more in the longer term rather than like immediate uh, yes, uh, response, yes. right? And, and I think it's a, like like most things, it's, it's an integration effect, right? And probably we have to study also these other metabolites that I didn't yes. talk about them exactly. at all, that are sugars yes. and also lactate, and yeah. probably they take all different paths, right? Yeah. Um, so what, what would be nice, it would be to see these uh, metabolites in movement. Yes, a flex, because right? We have, so how yeah. they, how they, <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so yeah, totally. what we've seen is that the, the transporters, <laughs> mutating yes. transporter, which is one step exactly. of the way. But, but then you want to know which path the they go exactly. through, right? <laughs> yes. So totally. that would be that would be my goal to actually look at, at GABA and lactate and mark exactly. those metabolites. So the other thing that see. I was thinking regarding that, right, is that lactate in the end can also enter the TCA cycle, right? Exactly. So I was mm -hmm. thinking of both of them together maybe somehow like collab mm -hmm. collaborating in that in that sense in that in, in in the in that same metabolic pathway in the end right 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 yeah. no metabolism is key here we have to study metabolism yeah. and yeah. um and also it, it, this is a my my next dream right it's to this is like moving a little bit too fast because i haven't finished solving this issue but <laughs> one of the things that i wonder uh, it's how um, these things can impact the next generations as well. So yeah. the one thing that I told you later was about pathogens, right? And pathogens have their own way to modify uh, nucleic acids. But yeah. my question is whether metabolites can also impact in future generations. And, sure. um, and I, have, I have some data that suggests that that is the case and that it's not... Um, specific to a single bacteria. So most bacteria cause uh, multi-generational effects by being commensal bacteria. So probably uh -huh. the, the traffic of metabolites and marking metabolites and what do they do later, it would be very important to actually move this field forward, yes. right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I feel you on that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so we have... We have a coming. We have a coming question. Uh, let's see if we can get at that. 
Okay, so we have a question from Krishna Priya. Uh, does the microbiota di di differ in different neurodegenerative diseases like AD, PD? Also, would it be possible to use these metabolites as markers for the disease? This is, this is, uh, the answer is yes, and that's not my work at all. There are people that have done it in humans, actually. Um, but that's true for most diseases. If you take, uh, I don't know, maybe you guys know a lot about this too, but whenever you uh, sample microbes from uh, individuals with the pathology, you, you do have this biosis. And uh, this is very interesting, the question, because all neurodegenerative diseases that have been looked at have problems uh, in microbe abundance. But the importance here is to detect which are the key microbes, what are the ones that we cannot do without, right? Yeah. And also how the relationship between those microbes that there are there are eliciting problems, or we don't even know whether they are the cause or the consequence of the problem. So what gave rise to Alzheimer's or PD? The, the lack of microbes or that the, the, the disease, because this is a bi-directional communication all the time, right, impacts also the microbes by the production of, of human metabolites, right? Um, sure. what, we can, what, we, what we do know is that there are, at, at this moment, people are making a lot of advances in this and correlating, for example, there is a study on, on major depression on uh, bacteria that are producers of the GAD enzyme that I told you about. And so uh -huh. people that have major depressive disorder lack bacteria that produce um, glutamate decarboxylase, for example, right? So there is no relationship that can be demonstrated. Now, if I put this back on your system, this problem is solved, but, but that's where the stories are sort of going. And the fact of uh, PD in particular, it's very interesting. Uh, possibility to actually reconstitute the microbiota of the patients by using probiotics, etc. But probiotics have their own problems because we have to show that probiotics actually, that the bacteria that are implanted, they actually live, colonize, live right? There, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that they don't go, get into conflict with the ecology of the, of the intestines. But, exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, but that's, that's a relevant question. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so I think I think we sh we should stop for today. It's almost uh, uh, half uh, half past five. It has been really great to interact with Andrea today. I also thank all of you who stayed tuned. Um, I urge you to join us uh, on Zoom now. So I've posted the the the, um, the room link just in, on on the chat a little bit above. Um, please do that if Andrea is still up to join us, which that would be great. Yes. Sure. Okay, fantastic. So I'm going to copy the link and go there. Yes, and go for it. And uh, and so maybe maybe we do a five minute break and we see each other on, on Zoom. So I hope to see you all here next week. And I'd like to thank again and uh, Dr. Kalisto for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you so oh, much. My pleasure. Thank you so much. I'll see you Thank in a you. minute. See you in a minute.